So yeah, this this is me. This is the institute that I run in Stellenbosch. It's one of the 10 institutes of the ARC. And I decided to give a talk that more talks to innovation by a corner of South African agricultural you know, research. It's more an applied type of a talk. I focus mostly to the mandate of my institute, but I'll give you a little bit more information about the rest of the ARC. With the abstract that I was asked to give, if it is written somewhere, the words that I would like to focus on are the ones that I've highlighted there. It's a, a similar institute to, you know, it's a non degree granting institution. We call it science councils. We run parallel with the universities. Here, I thought I'll give a little bit more arguments regarding the role of graduate youth, women, agricultural innovation in the scope of ICGB as I see it. And I'm a new uh, uh, member of the advisory council, so I thought maybe it would be good to do that. And I saw quite a lot of this uh, pay pay word or what you call it, the punchline within the you know um, the you know text and publications and print arts of ICGB Science for Development, and um, and I tried to orientate my talk around. You know these uh, these keywords. Very interestingly speaking, today is the sixth of April. About three hundred and seventy-one years ago, <laughs> this day, three ship, you know, sailed from Holland, and uh, you know, they would have sailed for the previous two months, but they arrived today in the Cape of Good Hope. Um, led by its commander, Wom Johan van Riebeck. And, uh, and it puts the context of where I'm going to talk to going forward with regards to the deciduous fruits, wines, and, uh, and the economy between South Africa and Europe in particular. And interestingly enough, the company that he was working for is Dutch East India Company. It was a Dutch company, but called Dutch East India because the route was the spice route going to India. They had to go around that way. And these lines that you see here over those years, they had to keep the log of the ship. So the darker the line, the more frequent the route is traveled. And I think there was a problem going to India, any other route, she could probably go on through there, but I think it was very dangerous and it was expensive uh, uh, and so on and so forth. Some of you who did history school would probably know this. I'll move a little bit quickly forward and uh, connect that part because about 230 years later, a young man called Percy Mortino, is of Italian origin, but he was English. His father was the governor of the Cape. And we talk about the uh, uh, about con political connection, if I can use that word very loosely. He got into the idea that fruit that came with Jan van Riebeck, then it was just a refreshment station. It was not meant to be settled. It was just to you know, exchange fresh food, you know, get, get vitamin C to the shipman, continue to India and come back. And as I said, there's lots of ironies here because the nodes of ICGB are in Italy, South Africa, and India. Uh, you know, Italy is close, it, it's close enough to Holland, so I'll probably give that through the connection of Percy. Another interesting thing that happened around the time that he was busy with the business of you know, shipping fruit from Cape Town, that's the end of the 1800s now, to England. And it became a very lucrative business because the ship that are coming back, they loaded some of the fruit. And this is a typical market in London those days. There was then, uh, as usual, a jealousy between the Dutch and the English. And then there was a big war that lasted for about three years, nasty war. We got caught into that <laughs> uh, fight, you know, uh, as the native South Africans. And uh, anyway, 
Another interesting part of history is a young man also at the time called John Tengu Chabavu, who was around the same age as Percy. They were businessmen. They were, he was running the newspaper at the time called Invoza Bansun. So a lot of these ideas, I think they came from between the two of them. I didn't learn this in history. I just got it as I was reading about his, you know, the, 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 the business of fruit, you know, race relations and history in South Africa. Then John gave birth to a young man called Don. Don became a professor at the University of Fortier. It was not allowed to go to a local proper school, so he went to somewhere in England, I think Scotland, sorry, in Britain, somewhere in Scotland. And he came back and became a law professor and he taught Nelson Mandela, and Nelson Mandela became the first democratic president of South Africa. So that was just an interesting background that I wanted to just share, particularly with those people who are interested in history. Now, fast forward to the new South Africa. Around 2012, we had to come around to say, what is our development plan? And we came up with a, uh, some kind of a national development plan um, for year 2030. And uh, keywords there are similar to the ICGB, you know, elimination of poverty reduced, reduction of inequality that has been caused by the whole history of South Africa and all these keywords that you can see there. But mostly looking at partnerships as a form of encouraging collaboration and development. And when you read this book, it's quite a big book. So when you do word crunching, those that are doing things like, um, you know, uh, doing studies about books. So a lot of the bigger the word, the more repeatedly mentioned it is in this uh, plan. And you can see a lot of development lot of employment, lot of leadership, countries, and so on. So this one is collected from Facebook, and this one I think is from the internet in general, for the word cloud crunch. Now I come back to the ARC. How does the ARC fit within the South African innovation system and governance and reporting? We are almost like a company. We have a CEO, Chief Executive Office, who reports to the board, who report to two ministries, which is before, before, you know, they were crunched down. Department of Rural Development and Land Reform became one called DARA. It's a long word, I won't repeat it, but it's a Department of Agriculture in particular. And on this side, the science and innovation and higher education, they were merged into one ministry. So these are universities now, and science and innovation is probably most of where innovation comes from. And uh, within the ARC, we've got many groups. I belong to this group for crops. I will mention a little bit something about animal sciences, uh, research innovation systems, agroeconomics. And these are, I think we discussed this yesterday in the closed meeting about what we call um, support uh, uh, departments. And as much as they are supposed to be small, they over the years grown in terms of how many people work in the CFO's office, how many people work in the Ajax office, and how much they are paid versus how much, how much researchers are paid. But uh, the same discussion you had yesterday, we have the same science versus support of, of that science. I won't really go into detail, but the mandate of the AFC is that it is a principal agricultural research institute in South Africa promoting all the things that I've listened to today, but we just have to just mention that with agriculture, all of those things are under within our, our, our mandate. How do we do that? I'm gonna go quickly here. Various uh, activities, we do crop development, animal production, natural resources management, mechanization and engineering, agro-processing, and things related to food technology and safety smallholder agricultural development. It might be not a word that you might be familiar with in the same definition as in South Africa, but South Africa, as you know, from the history that I mentioned, sometimes we seem to have sometimes two, you know, economies, uh, what we call large, historically advantaged economy and, uh, and the emerging economies. And that's why we talked yesterday about HDIs, et cetera. 
So smallholder farmers are normally farmers that are not yet, you know, at the scale where they can produce enough to sell, enough to become millionaires. They probably make enough money to send the children to school and, you know, put food on the table and so on. And uh, yeah, we do have consultation and training and we have the office of the administration of corporate affairs. The company itself or the organization has got about between 2,500 and 3,000 employees. Um, and I said between 2,500 people, sometimes we include students as employees if they have a tenure of more than two or three years. Some are seasonal laborers that come to harvest our fruit at a certain time of the year. Uh, so quite a lot of students that we do, but we don't give them degrees. They come, they do research, they are supervised by our researchers. The universities get the credit for having trained those students. Some of them, maybe similar to ICGV, might have spent almost all of their time with our researchers. And you have a research partner at the university or a collaborator who does mostly administration. Yes, you can register under my name. Yes, you can publish, just put my name in it. The university are happy about it, but they get credits for every student's graduated and every paper published. Um, our main business is to breed mostly, produce cultivars and license those cultivars to the industry. And then we've got a priorities to feed into what I call external funding, because government gives us what we call parliamentary grant, uh, but then we have to raise the remaining uh, budget for our institute, institution, and I run one of the institutes of the institution. National footprint, if you, I wouldn't really bother you because you know, really don't, but this, this is a, this is probably, I'm, 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 I'm in Stellenbosch, and most of other institutes are in Pretoria, which is our uh, administrative capital. And, uh, and I think it's easier if I put it like this. All the dot that you see here is either, this is a map of South Africa, by the way. If you look at that African map, this is the tip of the continent and this is Antarctic here. Between Cape Town and Antarctica, there is no land. That's why sometimes it's as cold as it is here. So basically, yeah, it's an IRC Institute. These are all the different provinces, totally different climatic conditions, soil types and everything else. It's quite good to collaborate within the ARC because I have connections or everybody else has connections with some land or lab or research station uh, within the country. As I said, I, I specialize or my institute specializes in deciduous fruits. Deciduous fruits are those fruits that lose their leaves in the winter. And like apples, pears, apricots, lots of European like uh, Italy actually has a similar type of production, particularly with the grapes and viticulture. Um, and you'll see a few slides later that we do quite a lot of work. When we looked at this uh, basket of fruit production in South Africa, and we had drought, by the way, about five years ago, which almost you know, crippled us because we normally get winter rains. But that particular five year series, we didn't get much water and we were counting down towards day zero. And if you would have gone to South Africa then, you would have seen that toilets and bathrooms have restrictions on water because it was quite serious. Now we have to think as the Institute, what do we do to mitigate to this risk? And fortunately, we've been doing work for many years to try to breed for fruit that can, you know, start to be adapted to warmer climates within the country which is why we managed about five years ago, around the same time, to produce what we call low chill apples. So the apples that, are, that can you know, produce without getting the normal low chill hours that you need for a typical deciduous fruit. So now one of our products, well, five of our apples, the biggest customers are farmers as far north as Limpopo, and it doesn't get hotter than that in South Africa. That's in the border with Zimbabwe, with Mozambique, and so on and so forth. Just to brag a little bit, these are canned fruit. Uh, canned fruit industry in South Africa depends on ARC cultivars, almost 100% of it. Myself and the uh, CEO you know, said, well, just in case there's someone who can claim that they have to just leave an era of, you know, of 2%. <laughs> 
But yeah, you know, we quite uh, for canning fruit, for dried fruit, uh, we're quite well known about that for many, many years. Dried fruit, I'll use that as a very example, it's one slide. We, we, we do table grapes, we do wine grapes, we do raisin grapes, quite a lot. I know Italy is number one, number two sometimes, but mostly much, much productive and efficient given the amount of land that Italy has versus South Africa. But we're very close to, to, to Italy. We are in the top five in the world for the production of these grapes, mostly uh, grown in this particular case in our driest province called the Northern Cape. It's big by land, but very underpopulated by human population. But it's known for this. And this contribution to the GDP is quite sizable. It's in the billions of rands, and billions of rands are, yeah, they are decent billions. You can just get that divide by. 10 or 15 just to get the sense in dollars. Uh, all the numbers that I'll be showing you, I didn't get a chance to translate them into euros or dollars. The number of people employed by this industry is quite a lot, about 30,000, more than 30,000 uh, people that are, are dependent on the raisin industry only. It's quite a hot province, so it quite makes sense that because they dry these grapes using the natural sun. What else did I want to talk about here? Oh, sundowner, all the grapes that we have were either you know dried in the common grapes, but we have been breeding grapes for a number of years. But about 22 years ago, around uh, just before COVID, we released our first cultivar called sundowner, uh, which is the first South African indigenous grapes that we are now selling all over the world. And the nice thing about grapes is that it's not as uh, brutal as fresh fruits that you have to ship it quickly before it rots, you know, you can keep it until the market uh, buses are conducive and then send it. I think Europe is one of our top markets and um, also now growingly uh, Middle East and, uh, and, and, and India and China. It's a, yeah, port, you know, it's a coastal country, uh, country like every, like uh, which, which I've mentioned in my earlier slides. That's where most of our products leave the country for the West and from the East. On average, since about 2007, about 10 cultivars that we release every year of different new fruits. Believe it or not, there are still new apples, new pears, new peaches that we are inventing for various reasons. Sometimes it's color, sometimes it's storage, sometimes it's disease resistance. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that if I do have time. Lately, these are the apples I mentioned before uh, that are more what I can call climate smart. These apples are, are, as I said, are grown in warmer areas of the country. We gave them some uh, a keyword or a forename Afri, we've got Afri Star, Afri Glow, Afri Rose, and so on. And we also have fruits. Uh, and the latest pair that we released actually was earlier this year. I might, if I have time, mention it. But it looks like that. It's a smaller version of chicken. And uh, taking advantage or abusing my power as the institute uh, uh, head, I named uh, uh, the latest one after my son. Uh, <laughs> it's called Rosy Loazi. Loazi is the name of my son. Loazi is translating to IP. So very few people could contradict that. It was, it was democratic, yes, it was. <laughs> But I had the, you know, the, the, the voting power. Uh, this is now the canning industry. Talking about South African, you know, you know, the difficulties we had before 1990, 1994, you know, being under sanctions. This is the canning industry then because government was holding everything. You could only sell through government channels, and uh, and and so the sanctions were quite uh, tough to South Africa, to South African regime at the time. And uh, and around you know the release of Nelson Mandela here you know, you know the market started opening up testing you know South African products after 1994 we obviously had a democratic election and now we are almost accepted to the United Nations and we can come and speak here without having any fear that we'll be arrested when we get back home and so on and so forth. So this is how the market has grown. And it's still keep, still keep on growing, as I said, you know, with China and other bigger countries, you know, becoming much more uh, happy to 
to buy our products heavily. Once upon a time, it was almost like antisocial to buy South African goods in the 80s, if you, if you know your, your political history. So now this is when I started as the director of the Institute around 2015, and we had a challenge, you know, because we are sort of semi-government, we're not a government department, we are what I, we call parastatal. We get some money from government, but we have to raise some money. So there's always, you know, some apathy or complacence from ourselves to market our products. You know, industry, the table grape industry collects levies and then they give us a portion of that levy to do research. But there's always pressure. You're not producing cultivars fast enough. Why are our farmers not growing your grapes? Why are we growing Italian and Californian grapes when we're spending money on the Institute? So I met with a new director as well of table grapes South Africa and asked him the same question. Why are the farmers in South Africa not growing ARC cultivars? Turned out that it was, again, complacency. We were, you know, we've got money, so we don't have any business pressures. So we went on to a very big campaign. I almost go to Berlin every 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 February in the fruit logistica, you know, to promote this almost like everybody else who comes and sells. So this, this is the hectares on only one cultivar called drivers. So it is the example that I'm giving, you know, for the rest of our products. I mentioned the low sugar apples. Once again, I can claim because I started around that time. It could be coincidental, but it could be influenced, but I'll take the claim anytime because um, nobody knows, you know, we don't have the powers of uh, uh, hindsight. But these apples are quite good. And they are also now, because the land up north in South Africa is, is not as expensive and historically, uh, white owned as it was because of the history that I gave you about. So now you can start to get, you know, larger and uh, more accessible lands being grown outside the, that basket that I mentioned down south, which 2014, 2015 gave us a wake up call that we cannot put because mm -hmm. industry in South Africa, no, don't produce these. You will flood the market, you will kill our business. And our business was very selfish because it was our business. Those who have been in business for many years. So, you know, if you start new productions, the market is going to be full. And then, but it was very, very strong and highly, you know, contested. But we as the Institute being independent, also influenced by government, also to foresee development, we basically, you know, went around, you know, against the, 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 you know, the, the interest of industries. It turned out that actually it was good for industry because those apple up north, apples up north, they are maturing and, and, and coming out of the trees earlier they want than the cold ones in, in, in the south of, of, of South Africa. So the season now for harvesting apples has been increased by two months. And these apples are the apples that you eat fresh from the tree before Christmas, whereas the rest of the country you eat them the following Christmas because we have to store them and sell them when the market is good. So anyway, it, it is very good business for our institute. Our revenue from uh, from royalties, remember that we get a royalty from each and every apple sold, so it is good. So probably why I still keep my job. Uh, <laughs> and now a little bit of science, because I felt bad that I had to talk about science, but I had to find something very relevant to what I've heard about here. Uh, Rodney Art, uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and I, he was our, first, you know, uh, uh, black student to go and do research on 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 on, on viticulture, and in a non-traditional viticulture university called the University of Western Cape, somebody mentioned that the HVU and HV. I don't use that word HVU. I say future or you know, kind of. I can't remember the, uh, the acronym, but it's more of a. You know, I was adopted by UWC when I came back from Europe um, from doing my PhD. Um, as a young scientist at the time, I think I was in my early or late 20s, uh, late 20s, early 30s. I got a lab, coincidentally, some people know Professor Jonathan Blackburn, who renovated a lab, but moved to UCT around the time I arrived. So it was a good luck. I mean, I'm talking to students here, in particular, making yourself 
not being shy, you know, make your professor, your supervisor uncomfortable in a nice way. <laughs> Don't piss him off, but try to, you know, try to read and be one step ahead of him. As how I was trained by Professor Tony Slavash. Very dominant London accent guy, but his parents came from you know, somewhere, Poland or somewhere. So he was an interesting character because he was an anti establishment person. He was feared by the university. Everybody was scared to be black. Uh, people ask me, am I crazy to join this lab? Because people don't last there. If they last, they last for too long. They don't finish their PhDs. So it is quite strict, but also gives you freedom. So if you abuse this freedom, you will get punished. But if you really use it, you give you more freedom. So I finished my PhD less than three years into, into from registration into graduation. Um, anyway, let me come back to my story. Uh, so Rodney then did this work interestingly because we've been drinking lots of beautiful wine from here in Italy. And what makes wine what it is, it's not only grapes, it's also the yeast. So Rodney was working on the yeast and the approach and saying nobody will take me for PhD uh, because they say my subject is crazy, but I'm interested to do what you do. So we then worked on what I asked him, what do you do? Because I don't want to give you something new. I want to give you something that you're already working with. He was already a junior researcher without a PhD. So we were, he was breathing yeast. So he said, you know, what are you asking? I spiked my yeast to the grapes and look at the different characters. So white, you know, white wine, you'd get some fruitiness, some grassiness, some, you know, floral kind of flavors and tastes. And some of his yeast were giving him some tropical flavors and so on and so forth. But then we sat around, so what causes that? And I'm pretty sure my theory said that yeast proteins must be contributing to that uh, flavor, flavonoids, and characteristics. So basically that was the title of his thesis. So anyway, to cut a long story short, yes, he finished his PhD. And around this, this particular paper, he presented it in this talk, in this, in this, this symposium, which was between ourselves and Crea. Is the Italy of ARC of Italy? Uh, they, you know, at the time, um, some people know, and um, I think his name is Massimo. He was at the embassy in Pretoria, very dynamic guy. I think he left now. So he is the one who insisted that Bongani, I want to work with you. Three uh, in Italy, the embassy will pay, yeah. <laughs> and then we'll do something good. And we did a lot of good stuff. This was my former CEO signing a collaboration between CREA and the ARC in 2019, just before COVID. And also the MOA is covering things that the CGB is talking about, things like uh, capacity building, biotechnology, and things like that. So we unfortunately got interrupted by COVID. In that particular paper, Rodney was, you know, anyway, he, this is his introduction. I think it's repeating a little bit of what I said about uh, apples and raisins, but basically talking about the table grapes for wine. A lot more people are employed in that industry, but it's not only harvesting and production of grapes, it's also the making of wine, bottling of wine, and, and cellar work and so on and so forth. A lot of GDP produced into the, our fiscus and uh, and all the value chain. And most of our wine, as I said, is coming here in bottles, in more now here in bulk, as well as going to China in bulk. And the rules about wine of origin depends sometimes on how much of the imported wine is blended with the local wine. So. You could have a French wine that is 80% South African product, but that's a story for another day. So this is just a schematic uh, picture because I saw arrows and some people say I want to emulate that, that eminent professor that spoke here so that at least I look and sound like one. So these are grapes mixed with wine, with, with, with cheese producing different wines. So Rodney was breeding these, looking at, you know, if I mix this strain and the other, what can I get out of it? And we did get four new strains that we are now trialing with commercial companies. They will, if they do pass the test of drying and fermentation, also come into the mainstream. Anchor 
is one of those maybe if you buy bad for breaking there is a big company that's originally from South Korea called Anchor. I might have their logo later on so that you can understand it. Uh, I won't really go into detail here. I'll just read you these three bullet points that there are many factors that affect the taste and flavor of wine, including the terroir, you know, meaning the climate and the area where you're producing your wine, the temperature and, uh, and, and how it affects that, uh, and also the quality and style of yeast that you're using. And these are the type of flavor that if you really are a wine connoisseur, you can, you know, uh, uh, get trained to pick up in your wine. Um, once again, this is a very busy slide. I won't really go into detail about it, but um, it basically talks about our uh, Rodney's yeast breeding program. Uh, this is our building, and this just talks about the workflow from harvesting our grapes. And we have all of these workflows from the Institute. We've got vineyards. We've got two big cellars that are recently renovated, and Portly, all the way to Portland, we have all this infrastructure. Particularly for research, but we are forced to also do it commercially. I don't have slides to talk about our commercial spin off company, which is also an interesting business model. Uh, I'll probably talk about it to, you know, to those that will visit when, when some of you come to Stellenbosch or to Cape Town, be more than willing to come and visit us. I've got just a few slides to show you the pictures and the faces of our students, mostly women and black. And um, uh, uh, for various reasons, because you, know, you need to really be more inclusive and developmental in our nature. We produce prototype wines, that's five liters, 10 liters, and, that's, and we've got barrels that are big, 1,000, 2,000 liters, and tanks that go up to 20,000 liters for the Institute. Just another workflow again. I picked this slide from him. Part of his work, you know, is also collecting from the wild yeasts that are in our vineyards, isolate them, we collect and characterize them. If it is existing already in our collection, we sort of discard it, but if it shows different characteristics, then it gets collected. We are at the National Collection Center for Yeast Strains and many other things. But in particular for this project, we are entrusted an, 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 an to collect all the yeast strains, uh, both private and uh, and publicly, excuse me, owned. Anchor, as I said, is uh, is using four of our four of their seven best-selling yeast, the AFC yeast. They've been there for many, many years, as I said, but we're now working hard to get more yeast into the pipeline because you, you know, winemakers are can be historically as well as maybe recently very conservative. If you want to make a certain wine style. We don't really want to play around too much because people have maybe became acquainted with your wine and style and place. So people don't experiment a lot. That's why you don't breed wine grapes. It's almost also, um, you can, but it's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not fashionable if I can use the, the conservative term. You know, if you want a Sauvignon Blanc, you want a Sauvignon Blanc as it was a thousand years ago. <laughs> you know, sometimes longer than that, if you think about other old wine cultivars coming from the Middle East in particular, they are still grown to date as they are. So we have started the breeding in the background without really talking so far much about it. But we also wanted to be careful that we don't, you know, want to you know, give an impression that we are too disruptive, but we are disruptive in a, in a, in a developmental way. We start in with the drought resistance. So industry was heavy. Oh yeah, if you can breed for drought resistance, it's fine as long as you don't cross the Pinot Noir and the Hermitage, which we did by mistake, by the way, a number of years ago. And it's still our only cultivar we produce in South Africa. If you bring a wine return Pinot Dutch, it was invented in South Africa between these two uh, cultivars that I mentioned earlier. So we got a steady income from that all the years. I don't know, I didn't get really the updated figures now because I'm really um, a little bit lazy sometimes, but it's growing, that's what I know. And this is my finance manager. I did a semester at Dexter. But yeah, it's, it's more than last year. It's more than the year before. So it is a growing revenue stream. I'm not going to talk more than reading the titles of these next remaining slides. Now I'm talking about the ARPC in general outside my institute. 
in Pochop's from, I think you mentioned Dr. Nuga, someone here, when there was a logo that I saw yesterday. He works on SOGA. I also, my background was in SOGA research. So we did collaborate on a number of projects. So a number of years ago, we got some Melinda and Bill Gates Foundation looking at various aspects of SOGA, particularly biofortification of the SOGA grain. You know, we wanted to make it more bioavailable for its nutrients, particularly vitamin, I can't remember, I think it's vitamin A. We also are big in indigenous teas. Some of you will know rooibos, very famous. And that's where the interface, the closest we get to medical biosciences is that we collaborate with the Medical Research Council on an extract of rooibos called aspalatin, very well known for having anti many things effects, including anti-cancer, anti-obesity, and so on and so forth. So we've been working for many, many years with Professor Yanin uh, uh, um, uh, um, with this, and then also Honey Bush. It's later than Honey Bush, but in terms of its, you know, in indigenous knowledge system, it's been there for thousands and thousands of years. And these are the Koi, the original indigenous inhabitants, so people of, uh, of the Cape where we are. Um, so we've been drinking that tea for thousands and thousands, but in terms of the marketing, Roy Boss is a leader. In even the Americans, if I don't, you know, if I offend you, it's not deliberate if you're American here. A certain American company or government department, I can't remember which is which, patented the word Roy Boss and the table mountain, by the way, and we were told that we cannot use it without their permission. Mm -hmm. And the Department of Science and Technology at the time fought for, you know, with lots of money to, to win that back. Uh, so we, basically we can use it back again, you know, how can you not use rooibos? Africans is only spoken in South Africa and rooibos is an African's word. But anyway, it's just the geo uh, global politics uh, that we sometimes get uh, confronted with. Um, as I say, the next big thing that you're going to hear and see is Honeybush, because when Japanese get their hands on something, it's going to grow big. And we collaborate with the Japanese here and you know, looking at this particular tea. It's beautiful. These are the leaves of, uh, of Honeybush. And, uh, and it's very nice tea, I can tell you that. We characterize it at the level where you can maybe make some claims about its, uh, its nutritional value and so on. Uh, another institute also up north uh, in Pretoria is our Animal Production Institute, led by Professor Norman Maiwasha. We do the animal production. We do both, uh, and also we put another animal Health Institute, which is separate from the Animal Production Institute. So we do all sorts of things and we interact at the point of producing feed because the, 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 the crops produce, you know, the food for the animals. So there's lots of collaboration between these. Many nice labs similar to what you're seeing here. And those who visit sometimes are getting very positively, you know, surprised about what they have in, in, in the country. We have an, also a freestanding institute, which is cross-cutting for soil, climate, and water. Also, that one is in Pretoria, led by Dr. Um, um, uh, Maila. And they also do all sorts of things from geo, satellite imagery, forecasting of climate change effects, collecting climatic data from 100 years ago, and also forecasting for 100 years to go, and so on and so forth. That's where we look at you know, these things that we can simulate, you know, if it can grow in this geo area and we see a pattern of climate change, can we sort of predict what is going to be popular or productive or arable over time? And then we also have a cross-cutting institute. This is not an institute, but it's a group of researchers that have a biotechnology platform, they have sequencer, they have uh, all the, you know, nice molecular biology too that was spoken about for here yeah, in, in the last two days. Very close to the end, we've got lots of patents, well, well, not lots of patents, but lots of plant breeders' rights. That's our word for patent in, 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 in breeding. You, you get a new cultivar, you register it, you own it, 
you can decide how you commercialize it. In the past, we left it at that as the institute, but now we don't have the money we used to have. So we have to follow our products, license and negotiate very hard and very business-like and get the top dollar that we can get out of it. So this is just the, you know, the numbers of uh, IP portfolio in plant period rights, patents, trademarks, designs, and other things. And many licenses that we license out to, 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 to private companies. Uh, I will just run through this slide. Oh, I, I sometimes put before and after pictures. This is a very, very old cell. As you can see, it's built in almost like a Dutch style. Um, but it went almost to the data before I started. I convinced the AFC that we need to revive this. But at a time when there is money problems, you know, how can we spend money on a building that will produce alcohol? Alcohol is bad. Alcohol creates you know, alcohol dependency. And South Africa as well, like many countries, particularly for, for the low income people, it's a problem. But I managed to change that around because I showed you the slide before that it produces jobs and the jobs means food security, food security, better life. And then most of it goes to Europe anyway. So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so anyway, they, 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 you know, I think the story was bought, fortunately or unfortunately now Shadrach left. But I think I did deliver what I promised to him because now this is a hub, you know, it's also, also a tourist site that people can come and learn about what I'm talking about, about the wine tasting. In, in, in not in a snobbish kind of, you will sometimes you get intimidated when you are with wine people. What I've learned over time that most of them don't actually know much, but they, as long as you can impose yourself as knowing much, then people don't ask you questions. <laughs> so here, you know, this is Valmari uh, van Brenda. She can really take you through and allow you to, you know, uh, test you. I mean, we've got proto, like we've got proper flavors and smells, and then you can also take wine, and she can teach you. Can you pick it up? Because it's an it's kind of a brain, taste, tongue, nose combination that you can, you know, set. To. I must run because I have to leave by past one. I don't know what time is it now. There's no time today, but I'm coming close to the end. This is the symposium that we had just uh, as a justification for this building. Wine industry is one of the most untransformed industries in South Africa. 90, almost 99% of it is owned by people that are white and male and very old, mostly. Their sons sometimes go to Europe and never come back. So we're facing a potential problem in terms of the sustainability of industry. As much as we have an obligation for, for the transformation of the country, you know, to realize Nelson Mandela's dream, which sometimes is you know, some people are frustrated about it, but in general, we had this. I said I want this to be the epicenter for black and women-owned wine brands, so that they can they, they cannot afford farms. Land is very expensive in Stellenbosch Bosch in particular. Uh, you need to have a lot of old world money in order to afford. Even if you're an average Italian person, <laughs> European, you can't afford land. It's too expensive. So anyway, here now you you know they also sell their wines alongside our wines. Uh, they come to Europe to market, and then if you visit them, you don't have to meet at uh, Starbucks or somewhere. You can meet at the proper winery without anyone looking over your shoulder to say, "Oh, what do you get me so?" <laughs> That's Africans for who are these people? Uh, so anyway, so it's a very good story. It's an evolving story. Obviously, it's got its ups and downs, like everything else. Um, uh, very last slide, almost. <clears throat> uh, so these are students. We also now pro students. I had a new word. Uh, Lawrence, you were saying that is outreach. When you have to beyond your science, you know, try to become a mentor, not because you are forced to, but because you acquire the taste. Like like mama is uh, something that we eat. And when you get a bulk of it, it really is very fulfilling. In fact, when we evaluate our researchers, most of which don't teach just like many researchers here, their job is to do research. And if you ask them to do something beyond that, it's like, it's not my job. But then I realized from my own experience that in fact, transferring skills to your students is as good as your nature paper. 
I always say when a professor comes to 65 years old, say, I'm the only one who's worked on this structure. Nobody, you don't want to let me go for another two years because, you know, this grant is not going to be sustainable. I said, no, you are a failed professor. If you are the only one who can study that, that bad, that bad, you have trained somebody to be better than you. In my criteria, I score you low than a person who can say, I've got five of me and all of them are better than me. And they are all running their maps elsewhere in the country. I score that person a 10. Uh, so anyway, these are the young people who are very, very enthusiastic. Some of them disappoint, you know, they drop off. Some of them, you know, continue. Some of them get married and move on before they finish their admissions. It's all the things that you have to go through. But overall, it's a good story to tell. I mentioned Rodney. Rodney, who, as I said, could not be taken by anyone for his PhD. He is now one of my experimental managers. He is an acting manager for one of the divisions for post harvest and agro-processing technologies. I won't talk more about the many. I think with Takalani yesterday, I, when the computer made noise because he won, she wanted me, she's here. She wanted me to sign a paper of her student graduating. If I don't sign it yesterday, then the student won't graduate in this if the break. We'll have to wait until. So those, that is something also that we run. As the company, we have a Vision 2050, which supports everything that I spoke about here, where we see ourselves beyond 2030 that the country has set up. Uh, and my affiliation or invitation to become a member of the CSA, I suspect that it comes from this family. I didn't nominate myself, somebody did nominate me, and, uh, and I will meet, meet some of the board members in May. And maybe Mr. Dr. Musoni will tell me, or Dr. Mdraha will tell me what they want me to contribute here. So I hope I made a good case for, 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 for you know, for not necessarily for the ARC. I'm not marketing the ARC here at all. Please, if you get that impression, that's not my intention. South Africa has got many science councils. CSIR, this is for industrial research, this is for humanities, medical. We are agriculture, we've got geosciences, minerals. And then we've got universities, about 26 universities, and we collaborate with almost all of them. Then we've got the NRF, which also is a funding structure, but also has its own labs. So this is basically the knowledge generation portfolio of South Africa. And that is my last slide, Grazie.